by collaborating with local boards of education and educational companies. His research interests include elementary school English education, language anxiety, and teacher education. So you can see we have some wonderful presenters with us today, and we'd like to welcome them and all of you. Please do feel free to put in the chat where you're joining us from. And with that, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Joan. Thank you, Heidi. Thank mm -hmm. you for the warm welcome. And hello, everyone. I'm so excited to see so many of you from all around the world. I really thank you for joining us today. And today's topic is my very favorite topic, and it's all about teaching English to young learners. And we'll be focusing on young learners at the pre-primary and primary school level. Now, the title of our presentation is Engaging Young Learners Around the World Using TESOL's Six Principles. And so my co-authors and I, as you have gathered, have written the book, um, the Six Principles for Exemplary Teaching of English Learners, Young Learners in a Multilingual uh, World. And we will be sharing with you some ideas from the book, but we really hope that it is so useful to you in your teaching. So, um, just a little bit of uh, an introduction and an outline of today's agenda. So we just did have our introduction and um, we're going to do a brief overview of the six principles and then talk a little bit about the four underpinnings for teaching English to young learners. And then we're going to take a deeper dive into the six principles by doing a demonstration of some innovative practices for young English learners, and then give you an opportunity to reflect on the principles and your own practices. So first of all, before we begin, can you put in the chat box if you are a teacher of young English learners, maybe what grades do you teach, um, and also where you're teaching, so we can get an idea of where you're from and who your learners are. Okay, at least I see, is it possible to have the resources? Yes, we've put some of the resources in the Canvas platform. I see Sandy says, I'm a teacher of adult learners. Well, you're going to learn a little bit about teaching young learners, and I think some of the activities maybe you could even use. Thank you, Mary, K-12 to in Mississippi, Pierre, grade 6. Teaching grade 12 learners from the Philippines, high school students in Morocco, K to 8 in Pennsylvania, 9 to 12 in Mississippi, 4 to 6 in the Philippines. Fantastic. I see we have a variety of teachers teaching in different locations and different grade levels. All right. Well, we will be trying to make sure you walk away from this session with some new ideas focused on the six principles for teaching young English learners. So in case you're not familiar yet, let me give just a brief overview of the six principles. So those six principles, they can be applied to any teaching context, any age learners. And these are the foundational principles for exemplary teaching of English learners. So of course, the first principle is about knowing your learners. The second one, creating conditions for language learning. And then the third, design high quality language lessons. The fourth, adapt lesson delivery as needed. And then the fifth, monitor and assess language development. And then the final principle is about engaging and collaborating within a community of practice, which really encompasses everything. So you see how these six principles, they aren't just individual principles, they all work together in order to create the best learning environments for your English learners. And so here, by the way, I've put this exact um, uh, uh, clip from our page into the Canvas platform so you can access it and use it. But here you can see that 
this is the basic idea for the six principles. So you have to know your learners in depth by getting that basic information about your students' families, their languages and cultures and educational backgrounds in order to engage them in the classrooms. Then you will know better how to create those conditions for language learning. And so here, once you know your learners, you can start to create a classroom culture that will ensure your students feel comfortable in class and then be able to make decisions regarding their physical environment and the materials and the social integration of your students to promote language learning. After creating those conditions and knowing your learners, then you will be able to design high quality lessons for language development. So here we want you to be able to plan meaningful lessons that promote language learning and help your students develop learning strategies and critical thinking skills. And of course, the lessons involved from the learning objectives. Then the fourth principle is all about adapting lesson delivery as needed. So you're constantly assessing your learners as you teach. You know, like you can create the perfect lesson plan, but things don't always go as planned. And so you have to assess your students and then be able to adapt your lessons based on how your students are responding. So you're going to observe, reflect on learner responses, and then determine how you're going to get your students to reach those learning objectives. And connected to that, monitor and assess student language development. So you're always trying to monitor how your students are doing and assess them. It's a whole process that is formative. And the goal is not to test your students, but it's, of course, to be able to assess them, to be able to advance their language learning and so that they can continue to grow. And of course, in the last one, by the way, this is a perfect example of principle six, where teachers collaborate with others in the profession to provide the best support for their learners. And so that's what we're doing here. And that's why you are here to continue your own professional learning. And so we're so glad you joined us to be able to talk about how to do that for young English learners. Now, for teaching young learners, we have to think about not just these six principles, but we, my co-authors and I, Vera Savage and Tomohisa Machida, believe that there are certain underpinnings for teaching English to young learners that these six principles are embedded within. And so the four underpinnings that we want us to think about throughout this presentation is that first, we have to have a commitment to children to look at the whole child, to make sure that we're addressing children's needs, physical needs, emotional needs, cognitive needs, and understand who they are at their different age and at their different levels. Another underpinning so important is a recognition that English is a global language. So English doesn't necessarily belong to any one country or culture anymore. Being a global language means that English is used by people from any country and culture. And so what we want to make sure we're doing is giving our learners the tools to be able to use English as they want to use it in their context and prepare them to be able to contact people from any country or culture around the world. The other uh, third underpinning is the integration of multiliteracy. So it isn't just about teaching students how to read and write in the traditional sense, right? We're living in the 21st century, and we want to make sure that we are preparing our students for all the different kinds of literacies, right? Media literacy, visual literacy, digital literacies as they learn English. And finally, because our learners um, are, are speakers of one, two, maybe even three languages or more, we want to make sure we recognize the fact that English is an additional language and that we have this commitment to a multilingual world and that we are also uh, allowing them to access um, the, all of their linguistic resources in our classes. Okay. So in our presentation, we want to focus on 
this third principle, which is about designing high quality lessons for language development. And so we want to make sure that you leave here with ideas for preparing your lessons with clear age appropriate outcomes. We want to make sure that you see all the varied approaches and techniques and modalities that you can use in order to engage your young learners in the use of authentic, and meaningful language. We also want to make sure we're planning differentiated instruction according to learners, uh, English proficiency levels, needs and goals and encourage students to be autonomous, self-regulated language learners. Okay, so I'm not going to go through these, but we're going to be giving you examples of giving visual support, auditory support, kinesthetic support, and tactile support in the activities that we show you today. And so, by the way, this also can be found in our book, and, um, and you can access it in the Canvas site after this presentation. So now we're going to take a deeper dive. And we're going to ask you to participate in a demonstration of activities for young English learners. And then afterwards, we're going to encourage you to reflect on and discuss the principles and the underpinnings and the practices that you see. So. If you're ready, then I'm going to begin. So, first, I want to show you a demonstration that can be embedded in a unit about favorite food. And so, um, I'm going to show you something that's my favorite food. Okay. And what do you see here in the pictures? What do you think my favorite food is? Sandwiches. Aha, uh -huh. sandwiches. Any particular kind of sandwiches? Something sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they look like peanut, peanut butter, butter, and butter and jelly. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. you see peanut butter peanut and jelly. Butter. That's right. Okay, so I'm introducing one of my favorite sandwiches, which, by the way, is very American. <laughs> A peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so let me show you what the song looks like. Okay. And I'm going to teach it to you. Okay. Because it's pretty easy. So, so to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, first, you have to take the peanuts and then you have to go like this. You have to crunch them, crunch them. Okay. So just go like this. Even if I can't see you in the camera. Okay, take your peanuts and you crunch them. All right, so just repeat after me. First, you take the peanuts. First, you take the peanuts and you crunch them. You crunch them. Crunch them. Okay, good. So say with me. First, you take the peanuts and you crunch them. You crunch them. Excellent. Okay, so that's how you make peanut butter. And next, we have to make jelly. So to make jelly, you take the grapes and then you squish them. You squish them. Okay. Squish them. Squish them. Good. So now repeat after me. Then you take the grapes and you squish them. You squish them. Squish them. Then you take the grapes and you squish them. Squish them. Excellent. You guys are awesome. So then the next step is you take a piece of bread and then you take some peanut butter and spread it. And then you take some jelly and you spread it. Okay. So the next part is then you take the bread and you spread it. You spread it. Go ahead. Try it. Excellent. Then you put another piece of bread on top. And then you take the sandwich and you eat it. Eat it. You eat it. You eat it. Excellent. All right. So now I'm going to start singing the peanut butter and jelly song. And I'd like you to follow along. All right. So here it goes. And I'm going to sing it from beginning to end, all right? So you can do a little movement. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. 
peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. First, you take the peanuts and you crunch them. You crunch them. First, you take the peanuts and you crunch them. You crunch them. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Then you take the grapes and you squish them. You squish them. Then you take the grapes and you squish them. You squish them. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Then you take the bread and you spread it. You spread it. Then you take the bread and you spread it. You spread it. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Then you take the sandwich and you eat it. You eat it. Then you take the sandwich and you eat it. You eat it. Okay, did you like the song? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and at the end, yeah. at the yeah. end, yeah. you eat it, so yeah. that's why you have to but... sing it like this. Because you ate it. Okay, so that's the peanut butter and jelly songs. Young learners love to sing songs. They love the movement and also the movements of crunch, squish, spread, right? The movements, the gestures are connected to the meaning. So it helps students to understand the song and aids in retention, right? All right. So that's a peanut butter and jelly song. Now, by the way, if you want to access a YouTube video of this song where I teach it, you can use the QR code and go to my Google site where in my resources I have lots of videos of different songs and activities you can use. Okay, so uh, now the peanut butter and jelly song is about a sandwich that's very American. But this is a unit about favorite food. So maybe your students have their own favorite food. Maybe you also want to teach them about other countries and cultures food. And so you can actually teach them about different recipes. And oh, I, I forgot about this. So after you teach the song, you can also have students practice it on their own. Are you familiar with chatter picks? Tell me in the chat if you're familiar with chatter picks. Okay, because with chatter picks, you can take a picture and then draw a line, and then students can create their own video like this. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if you're not familiar with it, I can teach you how to use chatter picks. Okay, so you can put the app on your smartphone. Okay, right here. Chatter. Okay, so in chatter picks, you can take any kind of photo. Okay, so let's say I have a photo of anything. Okay, I'm going to take a photo of my little coffee mug, okay? So I took a picture of my coffee mug with my little corgi. Do you see that? Okay, so then next I can draw a line on the corgi's mouth. Okay. And after I draw a line, okay, give me a second. After I draw a line, then I record and I say, hi, everyone, how are you? And then, 
and then it makes the doggy's mouth move. Okay, so your students can use the app and then they can practice uh, saying anything or singing the song. Okay, and that's how I made this. I just took a picture of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then recorded my voice. Peanut, peanut butter, and jelly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so feel free to use that. I hope you enjoy using Chatterpix. You can take a picture of your friend or your spouse or anyone and make them say whatever you want. All right, so now um, I also want to suggest that when you're teaching a language, sometimes it's helpful to do some scaffolding with your students. And so first, like this, I can model the task in the language forms. That's the I do. And then you do an activity together. And that's when the teacher guides the students while they do the task together, ensuring that everything's used correctly. And then finally, you let your students do it independently. And that's the you do part so that they can practice on their own. So maybe I model the peanut butter and jelly song, then we sing it together, and then students use chatter picks to record it on their own. All right. Now, as I was mentioning before, maybe you're going to introduce your students to new recipes. Great. So here, how many of you like sushi? So you might introduce them to a recipe. Now they have new nouns, the foods, rice, seaweed, fish, and then they have new action verbs, right? Spread, lay, roll, cut, dip. Then you could put it into the same frame as the song and create the maki, maki sushi with soy sauce song. Okay, so say it with me line by line. See, you have new nouns and new verbs. Okay, so first you take the rice and you spread it. You spread it. Then you take the fish and you lay it. You lay it. Then you take the seaweed and you roll it. You roll it. Then you take the maki and you cut it. You cut it. Then you take the soy sauce and you dip it. You dip it. Then you take the sushi and you eat it. You eat it. Mm -hmm. All right. So you could make a new song with a new recipe and bring in all kinds of recipes for your students. All right. So that's introducing them to other foods and cultures. Now, you can also have your students create a song about their favorite dish so they can think about what they want to do. Now, some people have told me that, oh, my, my little young learners, they don't know any recipes. Well, that's okay. I had a teacher um, and she was from Cape Verde. I think we have someone here from Cape Verde. And she said that her students made the orange juice and cake song. And it was just, first you take the orange juice and you pour it, you pour it. Then you take the cake and you slice it, you slice it. And they made a simple song about what uh, they like to eat. Okay, now let's say your, song, or your songs, your students created new songs in groups. You can create a game out of it. So they start by performing the song with the hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then they sing the song line by line, and students, other students have to listen and guess the dish. Okay, let's see if you can guess the dish. It goes like this. First, you take the fish and you cut it. You cut it. Then you take the limes and you squeeze them. You squeeze them. Then you take the onions and you slice them. You slice some. Then you take the salt and you sprinkle it. You sprinkle it. Then you take the chili and you add it. You add it. Then you take the mm-mm and you eat it. You eat it. What is this dish? Does anybody know? You could say it or put it in the chat box. What is this dish? No idea. Hmm? Let's see. Ooh, Valerie, ceviche. Yes, this is the 
Ceviche, ceviche, so yummy song. Okay, so um, that's how you can make a guessing game out of this activity. All right. So, by the way, I've done this song with teachers from around the world, and teachers and students that I worked with make all these different songs. The pupusa song from El Salvador, the tukboki song from Korea, the hummus song from... Turkey, the completo song in Chile, the brigadero song in Brazil, as you can see, so many new songs. So it's an easy way for you to engage your children with songs and food from different countries. Okay. Oh, how about the gumbo song? Yes, we need to do that. Create the song and email it to me and I shall put it up there. All right, now we talked about differentiated learning. Well, you can make sure that when you have students engaged in the ob objectives of your lesson, that they can choose the way to meet the objectives. Okay, so here you can see I've created a choice board. It's all about your favorite dish and students can choose an activity and use the new language that they learn. So one, they could write a favorite a recipe for your favorite dish with the ingredients and the steps. Two, they could interview their parent about how to make their favorite dish and then write down the recipe. Three, they can give a cooking class to their peers and use pretend paper ingredients or real food or gestures. They could, four, create their own new recipe and draw the dish and make a poster. Five, they could make a video to show how to make their favorite dish. Or six, write a song about your favorite dish and sing it, which was the one that I demonstrated for you. All right, so which one of these activities on the choice board would you choose? Do you like any of them? Aha, totally, six. I would use the song. Totally, I would use the song. You would use the, the song. Yeah, yeah. Is awesome. it is the most ideal for for introduce class actually? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, now I, I see. Go, in I will the go for chat. number three. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You would go for? I will go for number three, and then have a, like a, a picnic with all my students, like Ooh. their recipes and, and mine. Nice, Luis. Where are you from? I'm from Guatemala. I'm from Guatemala. Wonderful. I've been there many times. Welcome. Excellent. All right. So you might choose a particular one, and I see all different ones, because people have different learning styles. People have different preferences. But of course, you could give your students all of these choices, and they can choose how they want to meet your lesson objectives. All right. Now, I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Dr. Tomohisa Machida, to continue on. Tomo, welcome. Okay, hello everyone. So, oh, thank uh, you so much. I'm Tomohisa Machida uh, from Japan. Uh, now uh, in Asian countries, I gotta say in the midnight. So, uh, good evening, everyone. So, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, some uh, kind of uh, application of these ideas. So uh, John talked about uh, peanut butter and jerry sandwich. So I'm going to use the idea of the food also. So uh, students will use English for a, a global communication tool or co cooperation tool in the future. And then so, uh, but so especially in Japan, uh, like in the EFL countries, uh, use of English is very limited. Maybe students use English only in the classrooms. So how can we use uh, kind of English more, and how can I use uh, double of the students' abilities to use English, uh, especially in the uh, double of the 21st century skills? So uh, I'm going to introduce Ayako uh, in the uh, school teacher in Japan. So Ayako uh, did a great job to uh, integrate cross-curricular uh, topics into curriculum. So let's take a look. So in one uh, school district in Japan, a teacher is appointed to be a kind of uh, English coach. It's not a kind of actual uh, teachers, of course, that she teaches uh, students a long time, but as a, she collaborated with the Japanese classroom teachers and then helped them 
uh, develop their teaching skills. So this is one of the uh, topic, uh, one of the uh, story from the Ayako's uh, daily English teaching. So this time, uh, Ayako collaborated with classroom teachers and also school nutritionists because school lunch is kind of a very big topic for students. Of course, students enjoy talking with classmates and then also students enjoy learning uh, English, math, other subjects. But it's a school, sub school lunch is a very big thing. And then, so Ayako collaborated with a school nutritionist. Okay, so we're gonna use a school lunch as a topic. And then students can use the idea of other school subjects. For example, in this case, uh, home economics. So by the way, so school lunch, so what kind of school lunch do students usually eat in your country? Bread, rice, or beans? And then what's their favorite lunch? So it's oh, omelet in Pakistan. Right? Omelet. Wow, that's nice. Wow. <laughs> rice, yes. And then uh, noodles, yes. And then, rice and curry in Bangladesh. Wow, that sounds very yummy. Wow, good. So in this case, I call take the topic of the school lunch. Okay, then she said, we're gonna have a dream lunch. So this is a dream lunch project. And the students said, well, what's a dream lunch? And then so Ayako and the school nutritionist explained the school lunch project, uh, sorry, dream lunch project. And then in this dream lunch, students think about uh, some lunch. So they experience a lot of lunch experience. And then they create a dream lunch. And then they present it to classmates and teachers in English. And then that's kind of the competitions. And then teachers and the school nutritionists and then other teachers, they vote. And then if they win, the winning menu will be provided to every student. So that's so exciting. And then teacher reviewed, okay, so what, we, what did we learn last week? And then students start to think about it because they're learning. Oh, I learned this, I learned this vocabulary and this vocabulary. And then especially in this case, students learn the expression, I like and I don't like. And the students basically use those ideas. And then they create postures and then talk about their dream launch. Before presentations, they practice it. And then in the one group, and the boy and the girl, they talked about their dream launch. And a boy showed the posture, hey, look, this is my dream launch. Look, I like meat. And then so boys' lunch includes lots of meat. So that's gonna start a steak, and then also a pork, and then also chicken wings. And then the girl says, oh, that's not healthy, eat vegetables. And the because the before uh, doing these activities, Ayako remind the students uh, of the knowledge about learned in other subjects. So students, they learned nutrition and then also a well-balanced diet. So what's the green foods, what are the yellow foods, what are red foods, and the students know those kind of things. And the girl, they got the idea, oh, those meat are okay, but it says he, he needs to eat vegetables. So she said, oh, you need to eat vegetables. And the boy says, oh, I don't like meat. I don't like vegetables. And then the conversation stopped. And then Ayako saw the conversation. And then she showed this anchor chart. Hey, look. And then girl says, Oh, yes, we learned these phrases. And then she says, how about fruit salad? And then boy says, oh, I like, I like fruits. And then he added this fruit salad. Uh, unfortunately, his menu was not selected as a winner, but he, they enjoyed communicating with each other in English. And then also Ayako was very satisfied because students use the learned expressions and then also uh, this uh, using this anchor chart. So those kind of activities and then integrating that's gonna other subjects ideas. And then those topics is very relevant to students. That's gonna be very good things to develop the students 21st century skills. 
And then so uh, another example, uh, this is uh, uh, the same school, but it's a different thing. And then my university is located in the very kind of the suburb area in Japan, so not like kind of the big cities like Tokyo. So communications, uh, English communication opportunity is very limited. So students don't know, so how can I use English in the daily lives? But as a, in my universities, we have many international university students from many countries, from more than 50 countries. And then so uh, school district and then my university has a very good contract. And then students can visit our schools and have a communication with international university students in English. And then in this case, IACO's class can come to my university and then students, especially in this case, sixth graders, they have a, co a communication with international students. And the students thought about, okay, what should I talk? And then they decided to introduce their favorite things, favorite places, favorite places, and a favorite uh, festivals in Akita prefectures. And then look at these pictures. The boy, his name is Yoshi. He created the posters and he wanted to introduce Sakura. Sakura is a cherry blossoms. And then he created uh, these very beautiful posters, uh, put in some pictures and then some. Uh, as a nice maps, and then also talks about the sakura. And then students, they practice this presentation very well before coming to the universities. And then after coming to the universities, students, they make a groups uh, with a univers uh, university international students, maybe three, four international students, and then one elementary school student. And then on this day, students are very nervous, but they practice very well. And then, so Yoshi showed these posters to international students. In this case, Americans, and then uh, other students from Thai, France, and then also uh, Slovenia, other countries. And then, so Yoshi showed these posters and then says, hello everyone, welcome to Japan. Look, this is Sakura. We have very beautiful cherry blossoms. They are beautiful. I like Sakura. Do you know Sakura? So Yoshi enjoyed answering questions from international students with some help from Ayako. First, students are very nervous, but as a gradually, they seem to have confidence in speaking English. Of course, they don't understand everything, uh, but as a, some parts is okay, and then so Ayako helped them to uh, help some uh, meaning in Japanese. But as the students gradually get some confidence, and then a few minutes later, they change the seats and then introduce this same topic to another groups of internationals. So Ayako thought the experience of the authentic English communication can help young learners feel what it means to use a global language. Of course, in EFL countries, the use of English, the opportunity is very limited. But as a teacher needs to think about it, okay, how can a students think about that the using English is the real? Because the using can kind of provide an authentic context. And then also uh, students use it uh, English and then think about the topic as going kind to of personalize it. And then they create some, in this case, postures and then you know, presentations. Those kind of idea is kind of very useful to develop the students' English. Uh, communication skills, and then also their 21st century skills. Okay, I need to give my buttons to, oh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, one more thing. Okay, and then introducing food, nature, festivals, and then events in English. Of uh, course, every country has their own things. Of course, in many English, uh, English lessons, uh, US and then UK, those are kind of the main cultures. But it's not only understanding the English cultures, so-called English culture, but also presenting their own culture in English is very important because the students know it, students experience it, and the students can talk about it. Of course, there's a, some gap between kind of, uh, visitors and then their kind of, uh, students because students know it very well, but it's other, stu other kind of, uh, international students and then also uh, people from other countries don't know about it. They need to understand what the audience knows 
But of course, telling their ideas and you know, culture in English is a very powerful tool for students to understand English is kind of the actual global communication. Okay, thank you very much. And then I need to pass it to uh, the bell. Thank you, Tomo. Okay, thank you, Joe. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will be sharing a couple of uh, activities uh, from a young learner classroom uh, in uh, Sweden. Uh, I will talk about the pre-primary context of foreign language learning in a bilingual English-Swedish state preschool in Stockholm. Uh, these learners are one to six years old, and I have seen some of you teach very young learners. Uh, uh, I want to say work. something. Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Nobody continues. Okay, sh shall I go on? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Good. So uh, the teachers in uh, this bilingual preschool use English and Swedish uh, equally throughout the school day. Uh, and However, the children have a variety uh, of linguistic backgrounds from Swedish as a native language to a number of European and Asian languages, and some of them even uh, have English as their native language. Uh, in addition, most children have multiple languages uh, in their homes. So the children's groups uh, are mixed age and mixed uh, uh, ability. Uh, one to three year olds are in one group and three to six year olds in another. Uh, the children's English proficiency ranges from complete beginners to native speakers, as I said. So I believe that some of you can easily relate to this kind of context. So the activities I described have been developed by two uh, preschool teachers named Heather and Ian in collaboration with other teachers. Uh, responsible for the same uh, uh, groups and they work in teams to plan daily activities together, respecting the curriculum requirement for developmentally and age appropriate uh, uh, practices. This means that uh, they try to engage in children in hands-on multi-sensory activities. They try to maintain children's interest, interest and attention they tap into children's sense of fun, relate learning to children and their lives, encourage children to work with peers and build children up in the language classroom. So here's the first activity, alphabet show and tell for three to six year old learners. And uh, um, what we can, uh, or what you can see here are three uh, pictures of three objects. And my question is, uh, uh, do you see any relationship? Uh, do they have any anything in common? I mean, these three objects. You can put your answers in the chat box or maybe say it. Okay. I can't see any answers. But I believe you have probably guessed that all three, these three objects begin with uh, the letter P uh, or uh, the sound P, actually, then English names are pillow, puppy, and plate. So uh, the teacher have, has asked the children to bring some objects beginning with the letter P from home and to present uh, them to the peers. So here's what the children are saying, and I would like you to focus on the teacher's feedback. So please join the next slide. Okay, so three students are talking. Uh, this is my puppy, his name is Alf, he's white. I take him to bed, and here's the teacher's feedback. Elf is a cute puppy, pet the puppy, do you like Elf? So student two, this is my pink pillow. I love it very much. Once I lost it, and I was very sad. My mother found it in our garden. It made me very happy. 
And again, did you see that? This is, that is a nice pillow. Do you have a pillow too? What color is it? And finally, student three, plate, my plate, eat pasta. And the teacher says, I see, you like eating pasta from this plate. Very good. And then the teacher addresses all the other uh, learners in the classroom. Which is your favorite? I love puppies too. So the teacher has uh, uh, applied uh, all the six principles uh, in uh, uh, teaching this age group, but this activity specifically focuses on principle three, design high quality lessons for language de development. To support comprehension and learning, the teacher uses a variety of sources of input, such as visual, tactile, and auditory. Also, by personalizing language learning and contextualizing language input and production, the teacher enhances comprehension and memorization. She challenges children cognitively by introducing the alphabet and also projecting the new vocabulary on the wall so they can start to uh, learn to read. This further prepares children for literacy development in primary classroom. Also, teachers' feedback aims to assure children of their effective communication skills, even when their utterances are one or two words long. By doing this, the teacher assesses her learners in the way that is appropriate for them and builds them up, uh, uh, enhances their self-esteem uh, self and uh, helps them uh, um, uh, focus on, on English development there. Okay, the next activity, let me, yes, please, the next slide, thank you, is uh, nature water coloring, and uh, this one has been developed uh, by the other teacher who works uh, with one to three year olds. What happens uh, in this activity is uh, that Diana leads her group into the arts and crafts room, they previously collected small branches outside during a walk in the park, and now Ian invites them to use branches uh, as paint brushes for water coloring activity. So as the kids walk into the arts and crafts room, everything has been prepared by Ian and the other two teachers. All the materials for mixing colors and painting on the tables, just waiting for children to arrive and bring the branches uh, they have collected outside. So uh, while the children paint excitedly, this is what uh, the answer says to children. Please, the next slide. So she says, which color are you using? Yes, it's red. Tell your friend it's red. Good. Tell her what you're doing. Are you painting? What are you painting? An apple. Very good. It's a red apple. You're painting a red apple. And the child repeats a red apple. So the teacher moves from child to child and engages them in English based on what they are doing with their colors and branches. She tries to encourage the youngest one to speak or at least to follow her instructions in English. What color do we get by mixing blue and yellow, she asks. And the child takes two colors but does not mix them and does not answer her question. Without showing any concern, the naturally recasts it in Swedish, the, the child's native language, and with her help, the child starts to do it. The now knows that, that the child understands the activity and she switches to English again. So what are the strategies and um, uh, teachers' uh, techniques used in this activity that make uh, it uh, uh, age appropriate and, uh, and uh, language level appropriate? First, you involves children in hands-on activities that are motivating as they relate to children's immediate environment and life experiences. Children learn about nature and colors in a multi-sensory environment that is both meaningful and enjoyable. 
The learning environment extends beyond the school and classroom into the natural world. Children can make connections to English as well as to their native language while learning about their world. The scaffolds them in and their learning by modeling the languages, repeating new language, and using the native language when she notices they do not comprehend. She also encourages authentic interaction between the learners, so they start using English naturally to speak about their own actions. So, uh, yes, please, the next slide. Um, these two activities have been developed for children aged one to six in a bilingual school. And now I have a challenge for you. How can they be adapted for foreign language contexts or different age groups? Uh, please share your ideas in the chat box or maybe uh, in uh, Canvas discussion. I don't know, depend, it depends on the time we have. Let me just check the chat box. Okay, painting on the rock and wood. Okay, thank you. Authentic language in free writing, of course. I've been talking about uh, very young learners uh, in um, kindergarten and um, in some preschool classes. Yes, that's right. Uh, following the children's interest, that's the main thing uh, when we want to engage them in communication. Thank you so much. Okay, using both the native language in English when learning the names of the objects. Thank you. Okay, using it as ice breaking activities. Nice. Good. Many ideas. I cannot even read so fast. All your ideas, they disappear, I'm sorry. Okay, picture dictionaries, thank you. Yes, listening and speaking, good. Okay. I hope this is a this is a kind of a feedback. So many creative ways. Yes, uh, feedback uh, related to all the ideas you have here. Thank you for your ideas and for your feedback. Okay, clap again with pictures. Yes, bringing them outside school. Good. Okay, uh, in a bilingual school, it is easy really to immerse children in uh, a foreign language. This is not possible probably in a school context. But we as teachers can encourage their language use outside the classes as well. Okay, yes, picking flowers and guess and and using the names of the colors. That's nice. Yes, and we can always adapt it to, to our uh, culture. That is true. Yes, the, the the actual context in which we are teaching gives us uh, ideas. Uh, it's very good to, to share. Uh, some general ideas and uh, know about the activities 
uh, that are successful in some other part of the world, it is always uh, useful to know them and it is always uh, uh, um, uh, possible to adapt them to, to the te teaching context in which we work. So I, I hope the book will give you plenty of ideas uh, for your teaching context uh, and I wish you uh, great success with your learners, whoever they are. Thank you, Vera, and thank you, Tomo. Mm -hmm. So um, let's take a moment to see if you have any questions about the six principles, the four underpinnings, and the ideas that we have shared with you today. Uh, uh, Doesn't Machida have a question for Doc? Can you guys hear me here? Can you guys hear me? Yes, hi. Hi, 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 Dr. Machida. Hi, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Shin, uh, Dr. Sadek, Dr. Machida. I have a question with Dr. Machida about, about the cultural aspect. When you show a picture of the uh, Sakura um, and you get the kids to describe it, would you also get the other children to talk about what they look, what they feel when you see a Sakura? Because if, say, like in countries like Hong Kong, we don't get that because you don't, you don't, uh, right. it's not cold enough. So would you uh, would you like allow students the other students their classmates to describe about what they think when they see Sakura? I mean, I, I remember when we went to um, so, uh, we went to Kyoto. I was like, wow, this is you know, this is quite something. So even as an adult, especially for for other their fellow classmates, would you allow would you ask the the students to ask their classmates what they feel, what they think when they see a a, a vast park of of Sakura flowers? Yes, right. Thank you very much. And then, of yeah. course, the Sakura, uh, the school is very close to the big park. So that's right, why right, they, they right. see they uh, they see the Sakura uh, cherry blossoms every uh, spring. And then sure, also sure. The other students uh, introduce some uh, special food and then some yeah. festivals. Because in Akita Prefecture, we have uh, lots of snow in the winter. And then so yeah. they can, the Snow Dawn Festival is very famous yeah. in uh, Akita Prefectures. And then some right. students introduce those uh, festivals because the students experience those festivals and then also eat those foods. That's why they can mm -hmm. talk about it. And then right, other, right. yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, what, 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 what yeah, and, and so sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, what means that would you allow their classmates who are not Japanese to 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 describe or to exp express their feelings, uh, what they think when they see um, sakura flowers? Just they, they, they can connect with their Japanese classmates. You, you know what I mean? Like they could have, so they have kind of cross-cultural um, learning in that ways. Yeah, right. And then also uh, some uh, other things, uh, uh, cross-cultural, because uh, uh, elementary school students also ask the questions to international university students, because they right, right. come from the very different places. So that's kind of a good communication for students. Of course, some students don't understand what the other culture looks like. And mm. better those international students can introduce some food and then some, for example, in this case, flowers are very similar to Sakura. And then right. they have a good kind of uh, uh, good uh, motivate, motivated students to actually use English. So the uh, Ayako, the uh, classroom teachers, thought that's kind of a good moment for students. Of course, not only just introduce the ideas of food festival to other country students, right. but also they have gonna actually use English for communication. Sometimes students right. don't understand it. And then, but that's a, that's a good uh, experience for the very young learners who will start to learn English. So that's why I uh, introduced this one. Thank you, sir. Uh, big, bigger picture, and this is for 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 all, all, everyone here, really. Uh, uh, you know, for example, th we use like uh, we use uh, the Nelson English series in in Ho for my institution, Hong Kong. Well, that's one of the curriculums we have been using. It's a UK publication. They do, and again, this is a big picture thing. They do a fairly good job of incorporating different kinds of text, but understand me, it is somewhat Anglo-centric. Like for example, cricket. Or, for example, you know, uh, or or you know, learning about you know the uh, the uh, the Vikings and so forth. Uh, some people may think that's kind of cultural hegemony or quote unquote, but I think in some ways it may be it's useful for teachers to introduce, especially you know, if they do immigrate to other countries, Western countries, for them to have an understanding and to kind of uh, understand not only because they they know their home country very well, Hong Kong, Asian country countries. But I think in some ways it will be helpful also for teachers 
to introduce students to uh, to other cultures, such as Western European cultures, or and so forth. If you, if you, would you agree? And and what would what would be the best way to kind of incorporate and and allow students to understand other cultures, even though that e including Western cultures, without being like foisting their Western culture onto them, or so to speak. You, you, you guys feel me? Like, you, you, and this is for everyone. Kind of a general statement. Any right. any comments about that? Yeah, feel free to. Feel free to yeah. in well, you know, first, <laughs> one thing I could say is that, right. you know, since, and, and we mentioned it before, and one of the underpinnings is that English is a global language. So we really right. should be introducing children to all different cultures, um, not to promote my own book series, but working no, with no, National right. Geographic Learning and with our book series, Our World, we really try to introduce, you know, children to mm -hmm. cultures from around the world. But you have a textbook that you must use and it seems like it's introducing things from a UK centric point of view. That's okay. Right. It's just like if I'm teaching the peanut butter and jelly song, that's super American, right, but right. I can use that as the theme to introduce other cultures as well mm. as having students learn how to express their culture in English, which is what I always say is one of the most important um, kind of skills you can give them for intercultural communication, because everyone, even if you say I come from the United States, from a country, well, that doesn't reflect my culture, because mm -hmm. the United States is a huge country. There's so many diverse cultures, so many diverse yeah. people. So as a learner, I should learn how to express mm -hmm. my identity and the different cultures I associate my identity with in English. And by the way, you could teach children about another culture, but cultures are dynamic and they're changing and they never stay the same. And, you know, our children's generation will reflect culture differently from their grandparents' generation. And so right. um, in order for me to become a better intercultural communicator, if I can express my identity and my cultures through English, then and I can understand somebody else expressing their identity and their cultures in English, then we will have a much better and more successful uh, experience communicating across cultures. So I think that is another way you can approach culture, even if your textbook that you're required to use is centered yeah. on one perspective. So I hope that makes sense. I think Jesus, yeah, thank you, Dr. Shin. Doc, yeah, that. That, that, I, I, that, 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 yeah, that totally makes yeah makes that, Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Jesus yeah. Nieto, do you want to ask something? Okay, hello. Sorry. Hi. Okay, <clears throat> talking about the the culture, talking about the topic of culture, uh, teaching English. Something that I say to my students, even the younger, because I teach to um, around six years old kids, because they're kids from uh, first school. And so something that they tell, tell them is that everything that you say, everything that has a name in Spanish, put it in Spanish. You don't have to translate it, mainly about the food mainly about a uh, name of a uh, national places because i'm from venezuela um, i speak spanish and something sometimes they they ask to me uh, how can i say arepas in english how can i say nada in english i i, I told them it's just the same don't you translate it arepas empanadas just let it like uh, some uh, some uh, places has a translation such as uh, the, the angels El Angel and uh, the and some uh, some items like that. But something important is express the ideas in English. Let the identity in original languages. For example, uh, in Japanese, sushi or the ceviche, ceviche is a, is a meal. 
is a, a Peruvian meal, and it has some translation. I mean, you just have to stay like that for for the context. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, that is how we really try to communicate across cultures and we respect other cultures. And we are using English as a global language, but it doesn't mean that we might also use words from other cultures as we are using English as a global language to communicate about one another. So I really uh, appreciate your example. Thank you so much, Jesus, for for um, participating. And all the way from Venezuela, wonderful. John. And I definitely made an arepa song <laughs> <laughs> along the way. <laughs> um, and we had a question. It's even easier. It's even easier. You have to late then. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Joan, we had a question in the chat about the types of assessments that you use from mm -hmm. Supian. Oh, yeah. So actually, if, um, if you think about the, some of the activities that we used or demonstrated today, those can be used to assess your young learners. So perhaps for your objectives, you were trying to, um, like in Veda's example, right? Yeah. Trying to teach yeah, sure. the sounds for people. Well, how might we assess them? Through the observation of their um, participation in those activities. And uh, one of the things you would find in our six P's book are examples of checklists and rubrics that are assessment tools to keep track of your young learner's ability to use the different aspects of the English language that you're trying to teach. Okay, so um, I would say those are excellent tools for assessment that are continuously used. It's not like a test, you check off and you give them a score. You, as the teacher of young learners, continue to observe, you're checking off to make sure each of your students are meeting those objectives, and then adapting your instruction, right, as you see here, principle four, adapting it to support the students who aren't quite meeting it, so that by the end, when you do your assessment, they will all have met those outcomes that you expect. Um, Vera, did you want to continue yes. with that? I just wanted to add that uh, the choice board that you mentioned can be a very good assessment tool and it can be used that, to differentiate uh, your teaching, uh, to differentiate even uh, the assessment of your learners. So they choose what they can do. Uh, they choose the activity in which they feel the most comfortable to express in a foreign language. Sometimes it can only be a drawing, but it does not really matter if it is not a long text that you get. So we praise uh, every uh, effort of our students uh, and their progress in our classrooms. And of course, the activity, both activities that I have described today can be used for formative assessment in the classroom. The teacher monitors, the teacher checks what students can do, what their present level is, and plans accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, very much. And Pierre, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Oh. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. No, um, and thanks again for giving me the floor and the different presentation. Um, the first piece reminded me about uh, a course I have taken, or I took, you know, um, one year ago related to culture and integrating, integrating critical thinking. We were talking about knowing the student by using uh, the identity wheel. And so this is a technique that can help a lot when you want to have, you know, a overview about who your students are and uh, how you can use this knowledge to, to deal with them using the English language. So my question, after this uh, technique, my question is, uh, which other technique can we use to, to better know our students? Because knowing your student is uh, a key to success in what you are doing. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So I love your idea of an identity wheel. There are ways that you can um, incorporate students' autobiographies, like uh, creating different worksheets where they can express things about themselves. 
Either it's things about what they like, their hobbies, about their family. You can have them draw pictures um, that show aspects of their life. And that way you can learn lots of things about your students. Even a simple show and tell activity where students bring something to show and tell about, that helps you learn and uh, about your students and to know them better. So um, I would say anything that gets them to personalize the content you're teaching. Let's say like Jonathan showed that he had his textbook that he has to use. Well, any activity you can personalize, say, oh, okay, this is about um, clothes. Okay, and then you can express something about, you know, the clothes that you wear and that you like. All of that helps you learn about your learners. Oh, I see, Kasum, you said this morning I used two truths and a lie and learned a lot. Yes. <laughs> you know, That's what, what wonderful. What Pierre was saying, you know, what, what we do at, at our institution is that uh, after each lesson, we would have to put down some notes about our students' progress. Um, and also, like, um, it, it, I mean, day in, day out, we, you kind of get a feel when you talk. I mean, we, we have a policy that students cannot use their L1. Uh, we, 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 that's just our policy we, as much as we can. Uh, that's why with the other, other guy, Jesus mentioned that, uh, how to say, you know, this in, 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 uh, in, in English, that we generally, in, in our institution, we generally uh, dissuade students like, hey, hey guys, if you want to check out the meeting, uh, uh, look at dictionary. Um, for abstract words, it's harder for 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 uh, concrete nouns. We just use pictures or just use like uh, concept check questions. Going back to the other point about um, knowing our students, yeah, we'll do that like uh, putting down information like every week, you know, and also uh, we'll also uh, as, as as Dr. Shin said, personalized questions and tasks, and also like we I'll be also like a uh, uh, I would uh, we would have to make a photocopy of students' work for their assessments, like at least you know. And it, I would do sometimes if they do a really good work, I would just take a screenshot of it and then put it and then make make a copy of it and put it in their portfolio. So the, and we can kind of show parents what they do, uh, remind ourselves how they, uh, how they progress. And so and also in a way also uh, as uh, as our principal said, it's, it's a good thing. Kind of get to see like when 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 they um, how they interact with the parents. Like you know we can get a feel. And I know it's not it's not cumulative, but. When we when kids talk to their parents, or when, or even when we when we talk to parents, we can kind of hopefully get a feel, get a little window into how their home life is. I mean, you know, as much as possible. I know it's not it's not it's not cumulative, but it, yeah, a little yep. window to possibly how their how their home life is just by the way they interact with their parents. You know, it, it all Absolutely. Has to pick them up. I'll, I'll give some feedback to the kids after every to your parents after every lesson. It's kind of hard, especially they're not they're like yep. four or five kids. But yeah, it's just overall cumulative way of kind of portfolio in our mental and also physical portfolio of our children that that's that's how we have yep. a good over, overall absolutely of, uh, of and, and actually i that. love that kind of you brought that on. up i'm glad you brought that up because in our book also we have um a survey for parents where you can get lots of information about each learner from their parents or their caregivers in order right, to learn right. more about it. So just wrapping up for our presentation today, thank you so much, Jonathan, for your wonderful thank ideas. You. Um, we also present some ideas um, showing these different four underpinnings like promoting outdoor education for children's well-being as our commitment to children. We show examples in our book about, you know, creating spaces for real communication in English across cultures. Also, the integration of multiliteracies and our commitment to a multilingual world, building children's ability to use all of their linguistic resources with translanguaging, which, you know, we don't want to limit them to English only when they can be utilizing all of the different languages that they have access to. So these are the case studies that we also gave you some examples of from a Swedish preschool, a Serbian primary school. We didn't see that, but it's in our book, the Japanese primary English language class. And we also have a case study from Brazil um, using and applying the maker-centered learning. So we hope you enjoyed our presentation, everyone. And we have put um, these questions on our discussion board in the Canvas platform asking you to reflect on what you've learned in our presentation and what activities would you use 
in your own classroom, as well as why, connecting to our principles and our underpinnings. Um, and so we hope that you will engage with us in that discussion board. So thank you so much. And we hope to see some of your ideas on the discussion board. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everyone. We'll see you on Canvas. You. And in the next session, we'll start at 10.45 Thank you so Eastern. much. So, so we'll nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks for your information and for your great presentation. Hope oh, you then you. in the discussion board. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. The recording has stopped. Okay, we're bye, going to end bye. the Zoom. And thank bye. you again, Joan, Vera, and Tomahisa. It was a great presentation. And hopefully see you in the canvas. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you so much. Sure. Take bye. care. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye everyone.